Edmonton, about 40 miles from the Canadian border and 70 miles north of Spokane. It's, it's not like the Seattle area. Everybody else thinks Seattle. Here it's just it's mountains and small mountains, but still mountains and lots and lots of evergreen pine, fir, forests, lakes, rivers. It's I'm jealous, beautiful. honestly. Yeah. I thought Washington was one of the best places I've ever lived. Oh, it's awesome. Where, where are you now? New York. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, well, you see, the unfortunate thing is New York is like a venereal disease. It never goes away. Once you're inside of it, it does that to you and you constantly long for it and you have to come back to it. Yeah. If, you, if you've ever done it to yourself and come out here and lived, you know what I mean. Don't do it if you haven't. <laughs> it's <I'm>, just... <laughs> I've, not, not likely. I'm, a, I'm not a city girl. I like my... No. my uh, we have a property where we can't see our neighbors, and we like it that way. <laughs> that, how fantastic, right? I mean, you could walk and sweat before you see a living person, basically. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's so cool. Have you always lived like that? Um, I grew up actually pretty much like that. So I grew up in British Columbia in a small town called Williams Lake, which is very similar, and uh, we had 160 acres when I was a kid. So yeah, wow. wow. And then I have lived in cities. I've lived near Toronto. I've lived uh, north of uh, Chicago, and we live in Kansas City. And I was just more than happy to find my way back here. <laughs> I'm I'm thoroughly confused though because everybody I talk to in this country wants to go to Canada and you. <laughs> I'm from Canada. That, that's a long story. I came from Canada um, with my husband who came for a job and we had two uh, small children at the time and then he met with an unfortunate and untimely motorcycle accident and I was already transplanted here with kids who were in school oh, wow. and uh, didn't want to you know remove them and then I met somebody else and you know long story short <laughs> well I mean that's life right I mean wow how interesting so you end up yes. in like one of the best states in the country basically Absolutely. but I guess you're from one of the best provinces in in Canada British Columbia right? Vancouver right I mean it's supposed to be beautiful I've never been I really want to go badly it is. It's it's it is absolutely gorgeous there but, I guess um, Washington's yeah. kind of that same kind of animal right kind of what do they call it? Um, rainforest? Well, parts of it. If you live by the coast, it's rainforest. So, mm. you know, where you were in Olympia, um, you have rainforest. Where where I am now, it's not so rainforesty at all, actually. It's a lot lot drier than that. I'm trying to get my wife to go out there. She's uh, um, hesitant, but I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> she's uh unfortunately one of those wall street people so you know like her passion is oh, here so it's right. hard to get her to do any kind of serious talking about moving elsewhere right how right. much I mean, so you write fantasy but you don't write just fantasy you write fantasy and thriller and paranormal and mysteries and you throw all types of nice buzzwords into what you're writing right well that's um that's part of me that's that's my carrie schaefer identity i'm a rather complicated animal because i i have the carrie schaefer identity and right now what i'm building is my carrie ann king pen name self oh, and that that is women's fiction okay which is um <laughs> I, I got into sort of the fantasy books were not doing particularly well as far as sales go. And my agent said, hey, I think you'd be really good at writing women's fiction. You should try it. And since I have a background as a mental health counselor and have a lot of experience with, you know, family drama and grief and all of that <laughs> kind of stuff, I said, well, yeah, hey, sure, I'll give it a try. And my first book out of the box with that actually did better than any of my books have so far. So that was, that was wow. closer home. And so um, I have another book coming out here very shortly um, under the Carrie Ann King name, and Carrie Schaefer's kind of taking a break. <laughs> oh, interesting. So I can only see Carrie Schaefer, and I met you through Carrie Schaefer, right? Uh, probably. Um, you met me as Carrie Schaefer, yes, because Christina uh, introduced us, and um, I did not have an opportunity to mention to you my Carrie Ann King identity. <laughs> so. I'm, going, I'm trying to pull it up and I just can't spell and think at the same time. Oh, okay. It's Carrie, K E R R Y A N N E. I found you. Okay. You have a whole other website. You have three books out right now. Yes. 
and you have one coming out in 2018 called Whisper Me There. That's a great title. I love yeah, I think that. I love it too. I'm trying to make, make it bigger. That, <laughs> that is coming out um, August 1st, actually. So we're coming right up on that one. And I'm very excited about this book. I, I love this book very much. And, um, and another very cool thing about it, I have kids who are into music, always have been, and really quite brilliant. And so my youngest son wrote and recorded a song that goes with the book. So I'm just waiting on the trailer <laughs> to come out. Oh, yeah. So how do you work a, a song? You That's for the book trailer itself, for the launch specifically for that book? Yeah, yeah, that's trailer. what's... That's what the book trailer is for to go with the launch. So you are actually with a publisher though too, right? So you have somebody kind of guiding you along or you're help you've got people that you're guiding along. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's with this. With the publisher, they do a few they do certain things. So they put the book out and um I'm fortunate enough to be with Lake Union, which is one of the Amazon imprints. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, you know, when we, when my agent first said, hey, let's pitch a book to Lake Union, I was actually quite resistant. I did not want to be part of the Amazon empire as I was thinking of it, um, like it was an evil, evil, evil publishing entity more so than other publishing entities. And it's really not. It's and like the solution, right? In my term, like when I think about it, fantasy wise, I think of it as a way to get away from that old model and then something new. Right, absolutely. And they're brilliant, really, as far as they actually do marketing. And the other thing they do is they care about the authors, which, you know, you, you don't get really much. I've been with several other publishing houses, and you don't get the same kind of attention from them that you get from the Amazon imprints. And I've heard this from other people that are with the, you know, the other imprints also, but Lake Union is awesome that way. They they ask, they bring you in, they treat you like you actually matter to them. And then they have a plan for getting your books out there. Now their plan has much to do with the big Amazon marketing machine and very little to do with the things that I'm doing like uh, podcasts or the trailer, the trailer's all me. I just decided I wanted to do that. And I said, fine, have a nice time. So, that's, that's, <laughs> so that's interesting. my investment. <laughs> a lot of people say nowadays that Amazon ads are gold. Like oh, if you yeah. Buy, yeah. If you buy an Amazon ad, you know, you could go places, but, you know, a podcast or a blog or, you know, a, a good, awesome trailer is not going to really do much. But an ad, putting it where people's eyes are in terms of books right away. You know what I mean? Um, and I think there's some truth to that. The, the nice thing about being part of the Amazon um, group of publishing imprints is they do all that for you. So you get your Amazon ad, you don't have to worry about that. And then you're free to do some other things that are more, I think the podcasts and blogs are for connecting with readers. Me too. So I do too. And other writers as well, just the community in general, just to get an idea of what is out there to read and what people are writing, right? Right, absolutely. And then you get to know a little bit about the, the people that are writing the books. Yep. Um, yeah. And so everybody has a fun. little bit more insight, especially somebody like yourself, because you are coming into this. I mean, I guess I guess Amazon is indie publishing. And by <laughs> holding hands with Amazon, you're getting into indie publishing, but just with a monstrous dose of steroids, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, yes and no. Actually, with it, Amazon has that huge indie publishing um, branch that you can do, and I have done one book that way too. Actually, uh, Carrie, the Carrie Shaper identity does have one book that I did indie. That was because publisher I was with chose not to complete the trilogy that I was writing. So they they published the first two books, and I decided that I needed to have the third one out there, whether it ever got read or not. So I went that route um, for that. But the, the imprints at Amazon really are kind of like a hybrid almost, in that they yeah. have the elements of the big publishing houses where you do have an editor. You go through multiple rounds of editing. They have a copy editor for you. They select they 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 build your cover you do have a little more input into whether they um whether they go with their cover concept or not than with some of the other publishing houses but other than that it really is very very similar to all of the other big publishing industry people so you're writing women's fiction for amazon 
which sounds incredibly interesting and you know apropos right i mean it's very timely to write women's fiction now more so than before or are you finding the audience more available than what was available before do you think that there was an audience before I think there's always been an audience. I just, I'm not sure that it was always called women's fiction. <laughs> uh, what was know? it called? <laughs> I don't know. Fiction. I, right, I there's regular stuff. There's like people stuff, people fiction. People, people, people books. <laughs> so, Why are we you know, segregated? Is it necessary? I mean, are, I, are you happy that there's a second classification now for it? Yeah, yes and no. See, I'm split on that. As a reader, I have always read everything I can get my hands on. So I, I'm a very, I was almost going to say non-discriminating reader, but that's not true because <sighs> I like, I like books that are very well written yeah. and, and I'm picky about that. But other than that, I will read anything. I will read mystery, thriller, paranormal, fantasy. I love fantasy actually. Um, and, and these kinds of books, the, what we're calling women's fiction are books about people that are more focused on the emotional journey and I've always read those too so currently actually my new book that I'm writing right now the the protagonist the, male, the main character is a, is a man and Blake Union is fine with that I have a contract for this book it's a father-daughter story largely from the viewpoint of the father and they're still classified as women's fiction as long as the predominant themes are around the the drama of a of a growth journey rather than plot driven oh interesting and 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 um perspective wise it's from the father but obviously you're centering a lot of the plot on the daughter sure yeah and it's and it's about the relationship between the father and the daughter who have been huh. estranged and the you know finding finding their way back together it's it's also about a, a cello um oh interesting yeah and it's and it's fun because it's I love the fantasy. Carrie Schaefer gets to write fantasy, and I've been feeling the lack of that. And with this book I'm currently writing, I'm actually getting to delve into some magical realism. So the cello may just have a little bit of a component of a will of its own, and there might be just a little bit of a curse involved. <laughs> so, so you cannot you cannot get away from the fantasy element. You like that stuff a lot. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. Why it, not? It, right? It's okay, right? People write that stuff, and you can mix it into like magical realism or even women's lit. You know, I quoted myself, women's lit. You could... <laughs> I love right. the idea of that story, though. That's a fantastic idea. Um, to watch that kind of relationship develop, right? Over time. So, oh wait, because you had asked me about, and I said yes. I like I yes and no to whether I like those sort of classifications I in other ways I don't I've always objected to I don't want to be a, a women's writer or a woman writer per se I ran into that early in my writing career and I kind of rebelled against that it's like I want to just be a human being who yeah. writes things and I would like to be read as a human being who writes mm -hmm. things um, but in the world we live in you know that aggressive you gotta stop you gotta <laughs> on, yeah we're not there yet <laughs> the, the reality right now is that there there are people who will not read books written by women there are people who will not read books written by men oh, personally yeah, I I didn't know that yeah. going into yeah. this game, you know, writing my first novel. I didn't even know that other people wrote novels, really. Voracious reader <laughs> all my life. I wrote a novel and it's like, oh crap, those other people have done this too. I'm not alone. <laughs> Brown. <laughs> all these people that have done it. But um <laughs> but the point being, you know, I started noticing little things. Like there was a poet out in Oregon who was publishing stuff on Twitter and you know, he broke his phone and somehow went viral and he was getting attacked. For being a privileged white guy who shouldn't probably be oh. writing about blah 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 and i was like damn <laughs> right That's scary man because it really is like that you know where we operate in a in a kind of an arena where things kind of drip but every once in a while they'll pour and that's scary i mean you could be global in a matter of seconds Right. Well, which would be awesome, right? If it, if it were to happen, I think. <laughs> Not to that Oregon guy, right? I mean, people have like well, you know, hurt themselves true. over this kind of attention. Well, it, well, it's true. Or or been attacked. I mean, yeah. you know, you think about um oh gosh, now I can't think of his name or the name of the book, but the the gentleman who was actually under attack 
like physically in danger because he'd written what was it the lost voices or um sacred voices do, do, i don't know this book. Uh, it's um it came out of something to do with the Muslim religion, and I cannot remember now, and I'm really, that's terrible. It's a, it's a curse of growing a little bit older or having your head too full of books or both. Yeah, I think um, it's the second one. There's just so much content. On <laughs> how to create. That's why I, when I read Andy Weir's The Martian, I just stopped reading so that I would remember that book as being the best one. Like, <laughs> that was the last thing I read. <laughs> it happens sometimes you know you read a book like that and you don't want to read anything else for a while because yeah, yeah you want to rediscover that book right i mean that's the best part about it is that discovery process of picking up a book and going is this one going to be boring or is this one going to be amazing or i cannot put it down right absolutely and sometimes after you read a book by by a certain author you know then there's that <laughs> there's that being torn it's like if it's a pretty good book then i'm maybe going to be almost more open to reading the next one than if it's really right. really fantastic and then i don't want to ruin it which is not yeah. good <laughs> I, i'm totally about that too i mean terry goodkind wrote a series and i guess it turns out nobody likes it the wizard's first rule series i don't know if you're familiar with it I am. I tried to read it, and I, I didn't like it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, it clicked for me. Like I could not put it down. I read every single one of them on a cross-country trip. Like I would stop at a rest stop just to read the book, and so it got dark, and then start driving again. It was that good. I'd go to libraries and try to find the next edition. Um, you know, I loved that experience of discovering a series like that. Oh how did you, yeah. How did you read as a kid? Were you a library person or a bookstore person? Um, well, living in a small town, I did not really have a bookstore per se. There were the drugstore books, <laughs> which you know, um, that selection were ones that I was not allowed to bring home, but I used to read sometimes in the store. I learned many um, interesting things about life from some of those books. Reading those are like the romances store. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the romances and yeah. Um, I was a library girl and yeah. I read voraciously. My mother also fortunately was a reader, so there was a fairly significant selection at home, which was nice. But yeah, from the first time I figured out how to start reading anything, I was completely I hooked. Helps. When you go to a oh, library, sure. you're not stuck with, this is my favorite section. You kind of browse because you're going to run out of A's real quick. You know what I mean? You got to go on. And then the Dewey Decimal System is so confusing as a child. And you're not trying to work hard. You're wandering around just picking up stuff that looks interesting. You find the most random things. I loved it. My mom worked yeah. as a, a librarian for a number of years. So I had the opportunity to just kind of live in a library. Oh, Enjoy. wow. That must have been amazing. Yeah, I was a library person for years. And then when my kids were little, we did we did the same thing. It was a library. And I'd come home with all these books. And we, I... <laughs> always forget to take them back. I, I used to say oh that God. I was single-handedly supporting the library with the fines I was paying. <laughs> well, my mom, like I said, was a librarian and we hardly checked out anything. I think the poor <laughs> woman almost went to prison for embezzling <laughs> library stuff because we had everything. That All this stuff at the library that wasn't on the shelves because we had it at our home because we never checked anything out. Oh, um, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she got in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so women's lit is weird. I mean, you wouldn't find that in a library growing up, women's lit. I mean, you would walk in and just pick up a book and kind of start reading it. And the right. world is so much changing. I mean, you're not a woman writer anymore. You're just a writer. You're just a person putting out stories that supposedly should interest you and interest other people. Right. And and this is how I would like it to be, but it's still, that, that, that dichotomy is still out there. I have friends who write um, science fiction, who uh, one of them has taken, modified her name slightly so that it could be read as masculine because there are men who will not read science fiction stories written by women. My name is fortunate enough if I join all the letters together, it could be Brian a yellow or Brianna a yellow or something along those lines. I mean, you want <laughs> right, to kind of have, go. You look at that kind of stuff, don't you? You want to have like an, an ambiguity to your kind of design. You know, you don't right. want to be butchy, I guess, or feminine. You want to be just normal. This is, you're, you're not even part of the thing. The story is the most important part. You're just a tiny name. Right. 
I, yeah, I would agree to that. And, you know, fortunately, as one of the fortunate things for my name is that Carrie, K-E-R-R-Y, can be a man's name. And so his fantasy kind of was, you know, maybe could have been in my favor, except for that they took my fantasy series and put covers on them that were beautiful, but definitely looked like um, women's fantasy. Uh, <laughs> so, that's the I Carrie kept... Schaefer. Yeah, I kept saying to guys, it's like, you know, the men who have read these books really like them. You might like them too. They have, you know, stuff in them. You're making such a great life, but... argument against traditional publishing <laughs> because you're not unique, right? I mean, in terms of what they do to you, they really do try to shove you into a, a hole. They do, and they picked a hole, and that that was the funny thing, actually, because my first fantasy books, I just, I thought they were fantasy, and I was told, no, no, this is urban fantasy, and really secret about me at the time, I had never read, quote, unquote, urban fantasy, didn't know uh -huh. what it was, so I had to do a go on this crash course of figuring out what, <laughs> what urban, urban fantasy, fantasy was. was. <laughs> I had no idea. It's so subjective, right? And we really, honestly, when I sit down and try to tell a longer story, I'm not sitting out to write this thing. You know, I might be right. sitting out to write a specific story that turns into something completely different, but I can never call my shot. You know what I mean, unfortunately. I, are, I, you, are you one of those writers that can call your shots when you sit down to write? No, I keep trying. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking about that this morning is how many words I have cut from the current novel I'm writing. <laughs> like, how many, I, you know? What, what, what oh, is it? Oh, Lord, right now I could look in my darlings file and see but actually it doesn't really count because I did some drafting before I even started that one you know usually by the time I finish a novel I have at least half of the length of the novel in in it what I call a darlings graveyard file well, I so totally if my, what that was when you said it <laughs> if my book is if my book is a hundred thousand words to say just to, you know as a, as a number then I'm going to have thrown away 50,000 and, and I, I keep trying to find a way not to do this and it just seems to be part of my process so no matter how much I try to plan the characters have other ideas mm. right they get yeah, they well, get into the book they start to grow and develop and they're like no I'm not going to do this thing that you thought I was going to do at the middle of the book because that's not a thing I would do and then I'm stuck <laughs> I have to rethink it all well, that's the most frustrating part, isn't it? It's, it's scary to be dangling over an uncertainty in a story that you're like a hundred <laughs> words in, a hundred thousand words into. Oh my God, this makes no freaking sense at all. Yeah, you sound <laughs> How like somebody who's. How do I make this lie work? <laughs> have Have you been there too? Is that when you? I'm on. Yeah, I've wrote two. I'm on. I don't feel like either one of them are done at this point in time. I want to go. <laughs> I want to still go back in and fix it. Um, I feel like I'm a better writer after having written both of them. And wish I had the opportunity to rewrite them now as opposed to having already written them in the past. But at the same time, I have all these projects I want to write. So I'm on my third one now, right. aiming for a novella, and then. That's just you just get these words going and they just collect. I'm really good at short fiction. Uh huh. Right? I mean, I can nail short fiction to the wall left and right, but the novels just seem to just take a little bit longer. Well, yes, they take. Longer. I want to be they're, like a Heinemann or an Asimov. <laughs> I want my list to be gigantic. <laughs> well, and I I think that's that's how it that's how things happen. I I'm also I'm also really into creativity. I have another identity as a creativity coach um which, which is another part of my life so i really do embrace and endorse the whole thing about the creative process is it's like that you, yeah. you start on one thing and then you realize oh actually this might be something different and then yeah. having the willingness to be open to that and actually love that process yeah the truth is i complain about it but but i love it, it it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's it. exciting it is. It is yeah. exciting. In that moment where you're riding along and something pops up that you didn't see coming and you look at it and you're like, I, d I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have any idea that this was going to be a thing, but this is awesome. I love those moments. I just love starting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, re I really like the process of getting to a point where it's done. And I'm challenging myself a lot over the last couple of years just to really slam stories to a finishing point and then get rid of them you know what i mean find a home for them someplace and then move on to something else don't live with something you know back in the day when you're a young writer you want to love on something for a long time forever and it just <laughs> forever right you never want to let it go some writers can't even put anything down on paper they're so in love with their idea 
but I want right. to divorce myself from that completely and just want to rip through content and get good at ripping through content. You know what I mean? Right. I do. And I think that's really important. And that's where I see where a lot of people get stuck, actually. I, I think every book you write, everything you write, every story teaches you something different about writing. So as you continue writing, you become a better writer. And everything's not going to be good. That's the other thing I was... Nothing. I, was, I mean, normally, what's going to be good, right? You look at a writer's career. I mean, look at Moby Dick. What's his? What's that guy's name, please? Um, <laughs> Herman Melville. <laughs> Herman Melville. He wrote, like, probably his entire life, right? Like right. us, like every other writer that's ever wanted to write things. He probably, as a kid, wrote stuff down, died writing something that was unfinished, but we know two books. Right. Right off the top right. of my head. Maybe you dig a little bit. Maybe there's more stuff that would make sense or be recognizable, but I know Moby Dick, and I know, you know, Barbie, the, the Scrivener or whatever. That's it. Right. Guy wrote his entire right. life. I know two things. Shakespeare, and, we know everything that guy wrote, though, right? I mean, he's the one exception to the rule. <laughs> well, Shakespeare, and then there's all oh, these others, you know, Dickens. We we got most of the Dickens uh, stuff, yeah, I think. That's true. And, I mean, but think about know? it, though. Close your eyes and, like, name the ones that you know. It's not going to be a very big list, potentially. Well, that's, this, this is true. But it, I think the more things you write, the better chance you have of writing something good. <laughs> exactly <laughs> my point. That's what I'm saying. Like, the more you I, write, the more likely you are to write that thing that will resonate with people. Right. And and I think being willing to accept that some things aren't going to, you know, that that's the other piece of it. I, you know, straying away from writing for a minute, looking at somebody like Thomas Edison, it's like oh, he, yeah. he invented a few things that we know him for. And then he invented a whole bunch of stuff that was not good. Right? Yeah. And he crushed <laughs> dreams left and right, too, by stealing oh, inventions from people. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're not going to get into that part of him. Or the, I, th you know, I think that was the bulk of his existence, honestly. <laughs> crushing, crushing dreams and stealing other people's stuff. Um, the fog but, of history is kind of parted on his him, unfortunately. Man, yeah, Tesla, okay, though. Yeah, okay, bad example. That dude. Oh, no, no, more, no more Edison. Okay. So, <laughs> well, well Tesla, though, is a great example, right? He invented his entire life. And if you really yeah. think about it, what the hell did he do? You know what I mean? Everything, but nothing at the same time. But he did it anyway. You know what he I mean? Did it Crazy anyway. at the end. Right. And I think really that's the point is if you have the writing gift or calling or bug or whatever you want to call it, then that's the thing that you need to be doing. And you need to be doing it, not just hung up on one book. I, I know I have friends, actually I have friends, and I hope they're not listening to this, who, who have written one book <laughs> 10 years ago, and they're still revising and pitching and trying to publish the same book. And it's like, you know, you guys, you got it. You got to write another book. <laughs> well, I don't think you should stop, right? I mean, if you've got a project that you've said it's done to the point where I'm going to let people read it and decide if they want to give me money for it, then they say no, the people that you let read it, then you're not done with that. You have to look at that as a, an investment of your time and energy and you have to send it back out to somebody else or revise it in a way that works better, hopefully. Right. But at the same time, I, I'm not arguing that because there are books that people have worked on for 20 years that then became something totally awesome. But at the same time, I, I really endorse the idea that you need to be writing something new. Every time, every, yeah, a lot of projects. A lot, a lot time. of new things. So, you know, my motto really is, it's almost easier with publishing to to finish and let go because you you have a deadline. Yeah. If, if you have a traditional publisher, oh. you have a deadline. You have to meet the deadline. There's a point where it's beautiful, they, right. I mean, they say, "Here's a month. Get me this," and you're like, right. "Okay." Two weeks later, right. you're done. Ten days later, you're done. You know, you're done with it. You're finished. You sent it to them. They have an opportunity to judge it and say, "Okay, here's a check," or "I need you to do blah blah blah," or "No, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> and, Those are the best. Like, they give you a chance to edit it yeah. and then they pry it out of your clutching fingers yeah. because those are the best. Those are the, that's the fantasy as, an, as a writer is to get those little contracts and fulfill them and make money and then do whatever else comes up until the next contract. Right, exactly. But yeah. the, the point being that there are, you know, my, my thought for myself is when, when the book is done, as soon as it's done, and I am not going to be editing it anymore, and sometimes before then, like as soon as, you know, it's in a, a state of process, I'm writing something new. I've moved yeah. on to a new idea. I'm writing a new thing. And that way, always, always learning, always growing, always writing a new book. And, and that takes the sting out of some of the publishing stuff, too. Yeah, if because it, is, have, it does have a sting, doesn't it? It's poisonous. It, it can really sure, zap can your be. energies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. If you let it. it it's not. Publishing is business. 
Yeah. Writing, writing is writing art. Is part publishing of that. Is I mean, this is a business too. This is a profession. I mean, there's art. Yeah, but you're trying to take your artistry and make a, yourself a master out of it. Sure. I yes. <laughs> right. And at the end of the day, we, we're all aiming for those ten thousand hours so that we don't have to struggle so hard to write those stories. Which I think is ultimately what we're just talking about: is just make it easier on yourself by perfecting the craft that you're working towards. Right. Right. I, I would go there. I would go perfecting the craft. And I would say also just staying with loving the process. You know, yeah. it's the whole, nobody starts writing because they hate it. Yeah. Very few. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and what is wrong with those people? I've, I've never been able to understand that one, you know, because it's your chances of extreme fame and fortune as a writer are pretty small. It happens, yeah. but you know, not to most of us. So if you're in it, then be in it because you love it because it's a thing that you want to do and get some pleasure from at least some of the time right mm -hmm. so going back to what brought you into writing in the first place what do you love about writing what do you love about the process what's the idea that really sparked you with what you're currently working on and stay focused on that rather than some thing you don't really have control over of um, because whether you're indie or you're traditional uh, with publishing, you don't have control over how your book's really going to do when it gets out there. You, no, you that, think you might, true. but <laughs> you have a fantasy, right? I mean, it's just so hard to really pick the right path when you're an indie, and you see what the publishers up against up against as well. When you when I talk to people who do this on their own and are navigating those waters, you know, doing it a, a grammar editor and then a content editor and then get cover artists going on and then, right. you know, formatting and blah, blah, blah. And they're doing all these parts and pieces and investing large chunks of money into that book and then publishing it. And you realize that uh, there are so many things to fail at. I mean, there are so <laughs> many things that you're not going to be good at if you don't work hard at all of them. <laughs> Well, true. And, you know, failure, I, again, actually in the creative process, failure is, failure is your, is your friend. It's hard to get your mind around that, but if you're failing, it means you're trying, it means you're experimenting, it means you're doing new things. So I like to continually redefine that in that it's, it's not an evil thing to fail. It means that the, yeah, like you're saying, there's, there's a place that I could use a little growth and a little more, uh, craft building or a little more skill or i need to find someone to do that for me because so, i'm not ever so, going to be good at that yeah i it's so interesting how easy it is but at the same time how hard mentally that barrier could be to get through sending sure. stuff out be willing to fail be willing to accept that you're not as good as you think that you are i mean <laughs> or really, hope that's you a, are or hope that you are yeah i guess that's a better way to look at it right i mean you're always hoping secretly <laughs> well, because sure. Do you love your stuff? You don't love your stuff when you write it, do you? You're, do you have the doubts or do you have like, I wrote something great and it's going to be wonderful? Oh, it's a total roller coaster. There, there are moments when it's like, oh my God, this is the best thing that I've ever written and it's really totally fantastic. And then probably the very next day or later that day, it's like it's all, all of it is complete crap and deserves to be deleted from the computer and burned you know it, yeah. it's it's both really and it it goes up and down i guess there, there's an act of faith in finishing a novel in that, that there's yeah part. totally because man i i think i've forgotten how to write like halfway through sure. i have no clue how to write a story anymore i have no clue welcome, what i'm doing <laughs> welcome to the middle <laughs> oh god <laughs> what do i do oh i right. know blow up everything and start a new story everybody dies what? suddenly and painfully <laughs> <laughs> or not, or not. <laughs> or reincarnation. Or there is a book that's out now called Summerland. Um, God, what was that guy's name who wrote the um, What Dreams May Come? The novel back in the day, Richard Matheson. Okay. And Summerland uh, sounds really familiar. I have not read it, but it's sticking in my head. Well, Richard Matheson's a really great, you know, spec author. He did lots of science fiction and fantasy. And uh -huh. one of his books was What Dreams May Come. They based uh -huh. the Robin Williams movie on it, you know, right. the afterlife thing. And the place that Robin Williams goes, the character in the book is called Summerland. Okay. 
So this book is called Summerland, and it's about a political intrigue situation happening in like heaven or something. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I really think that the more interesting you can get your stuff, the better off you're going to be in terms of what you're looking at as your world. I don't think many people are really benefiting by writing about elves and dwarves anymore. Well, and that's probably true. <laughs> what? I mean, you are adding elements of fantasy to your to your novels, at least elements of magic realism, right? Right, to the current novel, yes. And and I'm realizing as I'm writing this how much I really want to get back to writing something that's a little more um, fantasy-based because that's so much fun to write. There are no limitations, right? I mean, you can basically <laughs> make up anything you want and have it happen. When you're writing literary fiction, you really are grounded in the reality of those characters, and you cannot deviate from that right. tragedy, that's, whatever, without them really being built a certain way. That's, that's true. Although I would argue that the same thing happens in fantasy or speculative fiction. It's just that, I mean, you build the world, you yeah, exactly. build the that's reality, the thing, but then within that reality, you are stuck with whatever rules you have created. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're your rules based on your reality. You know what That's I mean? The true. spider web of physics is whatever you want them to be instead of whatever, you know, our yeah. gravity dictates. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. And and that's fun. Although I did, I can't remember what it was now. With my trilogy, I painted myself into a corner with the rules that I had created for that reality, which was like, oh, now what? <laughs> because, uh, interesting. Did that impact yeah. the readability of the third novel or was that an after effect of the third novel? Actually, how it happened was I hadn't planned. I'm not a planner. So yeah. I, I had not planned it as a trilogy. The first book that I wrote <laughs> you know, in my head was a standalone. Oh, and yeah, when a the publisher picked it up, they're like, you know, we would like to think that this would be more than one book. So I was like, sure, okay. it's a trilogy. <laughs> I, like it. I, I like that idea of being published. <laughs> Let me make a trilogy for you happen. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So actually, no, what really happened is I think the third book, which sadly has been very little read, is actually probably the best of the trilogy because running into that limitation forced me to be more creative um it, it's kind of like you know people i'm going to take us to poetry just for a minute just just for fun it, you know people think that writing something that's very structured is creatively blocking like writing a sonnet would be very creatively limiting people who love writing sonnets say it's exactly the opposite because you have this built-in container in which then you, you have to really operate. Yeah, man, I totally feel that way with flash fiction or sure. micro fiction. I mean, when you're telling a story in a small amount of words, you've constrained yourself to be as, you know, um, um, as what I'm trying to find a word that I'm looking at brevity <laughs> in my brain and I cannot say it out loud. But you know what I mean? In terms I do. Of you just have to, I mean, there's a structure. You apply it. You, you challenge yourself to meet it. Word counts are another great example of that. Right, right. So so it, it really challenges you. And I think I, the writer, whatever it is, that I like to think there's a little bit of mystery around it still. I'm one of those people. I love the subconscious and all of that kind of <clears throat> stuff. And I think that when you give it a challenge, it, it it rises to the occasion. So what happened was when I pushed past what was blocking me with that book, it expanded into something that was more powerful and creative than the first two. So what are I, you able to do with that now? Is it just a learning experience for you to move forward with? Or can you go back and say, I'm going to rework that fantasy series, trilogy because I am wiser and better now than I was. <laughs> I, don't I, I can't. Um, and I don't think I would, actually. I, I can't anyways because the first two books are still owned by Penguin. And I own the third one. So I can't even really do any creative marketing stuff. But you own <laughs> the third one. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah so I did you could it. actually go, this is a standalone book. And I'm going to write two more books if no i don't know if you want to write a series you would you want to do a series again um around that idea no, no. i came to the end of that idea i did everything i wanted to with that i have um other fantasy series i want to write i have a couple of novellas out in a world i created that i 
really want to write either more novellas or a novel. And I also have another um, paranormal world I created that I love the characters and the and the people in that one. So I do want to get back to that. I'm limited on writing time because I actually have a job. <laughs> I want to touch base with you about um, your job because honestly, it's kind of a cheat, isn't it? Are you what, uh, having um, a job? <laughs> well, no, I guess. I mean, you're eating, aren't you? A, a I am. Food, I right? am eating. Eating is good. <laughs> Some of those people are trying to write without food and without a house. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> uh, no, you are a um, mental health professional. You get to see I, humanity at its worst. I, I am a couple things. Um, <laughs> I right now I'm working as a nurse in a family practice clinic. Um, Oh, I, I am a mental I am a mental health counselor, uh, licensed to be when I got a little burnt out and I wanted to take a break and I used to be a nurse, so I'm doing that right now. And the other thing I'm doing very, very enthusiastically is building a business um on my day off <laughs> along with writing. Uh, as a the as one a day you get. <laughs> <laughs> one day to do all the things, right? Yeah. Um I I am also building a creativity coaching practice and putting together writer re oh, retreats well, okay interesting yeah yeah we just actually we're just launching that i'm very excited christina who you spoke with previously we have put together the two of us put our heads together she does yeah. a cruising writers retreat Man, right now so and cool. i do the, that is so is, cool how come you don't do that with her i, I would go on a boat every single time until i get actually it's not true i went on a boat one time yeah. It was a casino boat in the gulf of mexico and i spent the entire time in the bathroom throwing up so maybe i don't oh. want to Maybe not for you. Yeah, no, I did not get sick. I went on the Cruising Re Writers Retreat once, and, and I met Christina, and that was awesome. Um, and I'm going again this year, actually. But we're doing something a little bit different. So we put our heads together, and we're launching creative wellness retreats with a, being informed by the Myers-Briggs Personality Temperament uh, Index, which is something that I'm certified in and fascinated by. Most people know the Myers-Briggs as something that's used by businesses. And it's it's just such a fascinating tool for understanding the things that make us tick as human yeah. beings. And so that's I've why I at, pay attention to myself because I'd like to hear I'd like to think I'd like to see myself on paper. <laughs> sure. I, right? yeah. I mean I like to see those numbers kind of broken down a little bit. So right, I, right. I, possibly can. I have no clue my IQ is though. I'm kind of afraid to find out, you know, it's one of those things. Um, My mom actually pointed out, you don't really want to know that because that'll influence you <laughs> negatively or positively. You're not even sure. And you might think you're really smart. Right. <laughs> Well, and there's some facts behind that. So to go down a little rabbit hole, as I remember back from my psychology classes somewhere along the way, there actually has been some research that indicates a huge impact of that. Like kids with low IQs that were told mistakenly that they had high IQs and performed extremely well, actually, and kids with higher IQs that were told that theirs were not so great who, you know, then lived up to that expectation. So there oh, is interesting. A, Those poor kids. Definitely. I know, right? It's a for the one with the lower IQs that did so fantastically well. Um, I bet that I bet that study was done in the 50s by Skinner. Probably. B.F. Skinner. Probably. Skinner's scary. <laughs> Skinner was one scary dude, man. He that's was the only, scary. That's the only person I remember from my abnormal psychology class. My friend, B.F. <laughs> Skinner. And Pavlov. <laughs> His dog. Yeah, and Pavlov, right? The thing I love about Myers-Briggs is it's not an index. It's not looking for pathology. So whatever you come out on it is good. It, it's not saying, you know, you should be this or you should be that and here you are this. It's just pointing out, look, these are the preferences that you were kind of came into this world with. It's always looking at the natural inborn preference that yeah. we all have for how you prefer to be in the world. Not that you can't be the other ways, but these are the things that are easier for you that it's you're really more likely long, to select. It's a really long test with a lot of lot of questions about would you prefer to put on a play or would you prefer to read a book or would you prefer to do math problems and stuff like that, right? Um, those I'm not thinking about something I, totally different. I, I, the VA gave me that test <laughs> and it said I should be a writer and then it said goodbye. Yeah, no, it's different. You, you're thinking of a you're thinking of a test that I'm trying to think which one it is. It's probably some kind of an aptitude test. Mm. So what the Myers Briggs tells you is whether you are more likely to get your energy 
from focusing on the external world and the people or from being introspective and thinking about things internally, which tends to, you know, that brings us to the whole extrovert introvert um, dichotomy, which is often misunderstood. <laughs> we're, we're all on there, you know, in a range somewhere. And it doesn't mean you love people or hate people. It's just kind of how your energy flows. And it also tells you about how you prefer to make decisions about things, how you prefer to get your information, and then how you prefer to act on that stuff. And so this for me right now, I'm, I'm exploring and having fun with clients that looking at how does this impact the creative process? What kind of light can we shed on the creative process for you so that you can stop trying to adopt other people's creative processes right. and trust that what is sort of your natural inclination might be okay. So, you know, if you're a pantser writer, maybe you could stop trying to be a plotter because all the plotters out there are telling you you should be a plotter, right? <laughs> so it's, well, you know, it's, my it's, problem is, is the after effect of the writing, what to do with the actual writing itself, you know, how much effort mm -hmm. to put into rewrites, when to call quits on it, and, you know, organization, stuff like that. It's a whole other element of creativity in my book. Sure. You know what I mean? Once I actually nailed down some files and you know, started doing things a little bit more organized. My podcast started taking less time. And <laughs> I mean, that just took some no brainer things like labeling and being a little bit more, it just felt good. You know what I mean? But it's not something I right. typically do. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, and, and it sounds like, you know, for you doing, doing the organization thing might not have been your, your first impulse, but still a really good and helpful thing to know. So, you know, right. other, <laughs> other, other point about the Myers-Briggs again, is that the things that are our preferences doesn't mean we can't do the other things, it just means that we may have to, or want to have a look at those things and see, you know, yeah. how, what would work for us. For me, for example, I am so not a plotter. Um, my, my Myers-Briggs temperament results, I'm, I'm an INFP, and so we're not going to get into that clearly too much right now, but the, the last okay, part I've of that I've done this test. Part, I don't know. I do not know what mine is, but I have done that. <laughs> I wish I knew. The, the, the <laughs> P part of that means that I do not like closed doors. I do not like to have decisions made. I like wide open. Oh, you know, I'm not interested. I lose track of time, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And people like me tend not to like to plot because we're not much into planning, right? You want to be open to the moment. If I make a decision here, then, oh my God, what if five minutes down the road, something else turns up that I wanted to do instead. And now I can't because I've committed to this other thing. So that makes plotting kind of difficult, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't plot at all. So, you know, it took me a while as a writer to find the happy medium <laughs> and find a system of, of plotting that is more I write along but I'm watching for things as I go so it's kind of like you're taking the scenic route but you're still looking for the towns along the way to where you're trying to get right yeah just um helping people to understand that this is what's natural for them and that that's okay and that hey here's something from the other side of the camp that you might consider that might be helpful for you uh yeah that's a lot of fun to to do with people and see life what? go on where is the clinic going to be taking uh, taking place? Uh, the the retreat, you mean? Yes, I'm sorry. That we're doing the, the retreat is going to be on Whidbey Island, and we have our first one set. We actually have our very first person signed up, even though we had not officially announced it yet. So we're very excited, and it's going to be Whidbey Island, which is just north of Seattle. Oh, cool! Sounds so, familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can actually get on a shuttle and there's a ferry and it's a beautiful island and we have a fantastic mansion with private grounds and everything that we've rented got a chef you know we're going to do good food and good rest and lots of downtime but with some some great programming also and i think i'm thinking april 4 through 8 we're doing that 2019 well that's a long time away Yes, unless you're planning. Ha, see, I'm not much of a planner, but see, that's the other thing about knowing these things about ourselves, because Christina is a planner. So, so we work really well together and kind of balance each other out. So that, that works great. For me, the thing that's most impressive about this is the coordination aspects of the people that will be attending the, the retreat. Mm -hmm. Are they people that you and Christine, Christine, Christina? Christina. Christina. My brain doesn't want to work ever. 
let alone on a podcast. But I mean, is this something that um that I mean, how, do you have a clientele already in mind that you you address, you bring, you invite them to it, or are you advertising in some way? Does that make sense? We, we, we will be doing both. You're, so you're, it sounds like you're asking about the logistics of how we are going to get the word of this out to the people who would appreciate and yep. want to attend such a thing. Perfect. That, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's a mix of both. Like I already, this one person that I had in mind, I had talked to her about this when Christina and I first had the idea. And I said, mm -hmm. hey, we're talking about doing this thing. And she's like, oh man, that sounds awesome. If you ever get that together, let me know. So I emailed her, hey, we're go, we're launching this on Wednesday. And she has already signed up today and tomorrow's Wednesday. So that was, you know, that was an awesome thing. That we, we like that, that's encouraging. Um, but going forward, we're just very enthusiastic, which carries, carries us a long way. We'll be talking to the people she knows at Cruising Writers. We'll be talking to our friends on Facebook. We'll be getting the word out to writers groups. I'll be telling people about it when I go to writers conferences. Um, you know, I find, all of that. I find this idea incredibly interesting because you are kind of treating creativity like you do a diet in a way, like an out put input type situation and putting the best ingredients possible in front of the person to make that work the best. Yeah, actually, I like that. I like that analogy. Um, creative wellness is, I, it's, I, I always I get a little <clears throat> tongue tied when I start trying to talk about this, but I really feel strongly it's it's part of what makes us healthy if you have a creative calling and you're not doing your creative thing i personally believe you're <laughs> gonna get you're gonna get sick you're, yeah. you're gonna get mentally ill or you're going to get physically ill or both because that's something that you need to be doing that's part of that's a sort of the innate part of who you are it's one of your core things that make you you so if you're denying that if you're discounting it if you're devaluing it which so many of us do, I, it, yeah. I, I did for years you know it's I did a little storyboard thing the other day I did a training with uh, somebody who as part of business uh, planning takes you through a you know before you got the idea and after in the form of a storyboard and I looked at that and I had these like June Cleaver pictures on there from the early part of my life <laughs> remembering that I was trying to be this person that I was not you know the the woman who does all of the housework and makes all of the meals and is there at every event for her children and is completely focused on them to the exclusion of all else and I was miserable I loved my kids and they know I love them and they're yeah. both very creative which is awesome but I was depressed when I look back on that because well, I honestly, was not valuing I mean, my writing you are um I don't know left brain right brain I think they've actually decided that's kind of bull poopy but uh <laughs> <laughs> I think I've read an article about that recently but I mean the idea that you got a nursing degree you've been working yeah. in healthcare you've worked in mental health um, you know, as a clinician or however that works. I mean, these, these are logic brain things that you have to set your mind to and memorize stuff that actually exists and not create anything. <laughs> the, 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 the things that you do on a daily basis, there's an A and there's a Z and you go through every single step or people die. You know what I mean? You don't yeah. improvise in the middle of that unless you really desperately have to. Um, right. But you, on the <laughs> other hand, want to improvise. You want to put stuff down. You don't want to plot. You want to, you know, you want to, you want to, you know, right by the seat of your pants all the time. It's very interesting that you can't, no wonder you're depressed, right? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, nursing, um, nursing is very much that way. If we were talking about it in the Myers-Briggs terms, it's what I would call a very, um, a profession that is very inhabited by people who prefer to get their information in very factual ways rather than big ideas and theories. And they tend to be the opposite type of me where I'm a perceiving or a P at the end of mine. They are of the what we call the judging type, which doesn't mean they're judgmental at all. It means that they like things to follow in a logical order. They like schedules and um, decisions to be made. And those are the really good nurses. And I knew when I first graduated from nursing that I was never going to be like an absolutely awesome nurse because I'm not like that right but we can do the other things it's just a little bit harder um 
I, w I would argue with you about mental health because that is a lot more of a intuitive creative process. Yeah, yes, it is, isn't it? Because you really have to deal with people in a way that isn't logical and sometimes it's bad. I mean, when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with anybody, when you're having a conversation or you're doing like this, you have to be on your toes. I mean, you have to be, I have to be listening to what you're saying and be uh -huh. ready to fill spots of dead air sure. and keep the conversation going in a friendly manner, right? So I'm constantly, I never relax when I'm talking to somebody. And if I do, I lose track of what they're saying and I have no clue what to say. And <laughs> right. you probably I mean, notice me like come back and say something completely ridiculous. It's because I'm getting the conversation back on my side of the court and I have no clue what we were just talking about. Happens right. all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's normal human nature, right? That's right. How, that's who we are as human beings. And that's that's why the whole mental health thing is not cut and dry because yes, exactly. human human beings are not logical. Even the most no. logical of us are not always logical. And you, <laughs> and we can't see ourselves. That's the other piece that's very yeah, interesting. Is these are these whole parts of our personality that we're completely blind to. My God, you we, know, you've never actually seen yourself in reality either, ever. Right. You've seen yourself in a reflection, but there's not even a guarantee the reflection was a true representation right. of what you are in real life. I mean, you've never seen yourself. You've never seen your face. I know. You've never looked at isn't, yourself. Isn't that totally mind-blowing? Yeah, you're stuck inside that thing. You're stuck inside your meat mobile. <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy, and but it's awesome. See, I love those kinds of ideas. Those are things that that make me get all uh, excited and thinking and mm -hmm. inspire like ideas. And... Yep, I love it. Um, we've we've been talking for just about over an hour. I'm not quite sure when we started. I think it was a little bit before one. I'm not entirely 100% sure. Right on about an hour. So we're about an hour right now. So I won't hold you up too much longer. Was there anything else that we neglected to mention? Of course, I don't have any um, notes or anything to to rely on to <laughs> help this process out a little bit. I don't. I don't think so. I, you know, I did want to um, mention that. Well, what we already did about the creative wellness retreat. Where can they go and to learn more information about that and they sign up? Can we have a website and it is creativewellnessretreats.com. So they can go there and they can find more about me and their creativity coaching if anybody is interested at swimmingnorth.com. Swimming North, okay. And then um, about my new book that's coming out that can be found at my author website of curieandking.com. So you've got a bunch of different websites. I do, yeah. <laughs> you need to get some redirects going on, I think. That that would be cool. I need to hire somebody to do some stuff for me, probably, is what I need to do. Right. I mean, that's that, that going right back to the beginning of the conversation when we talked about traditional. Somebody would have handled that for you in that situation, potentially. I don't know. No. <laughs> John, John no. Scalzi uses a WordPress, WordPress. So, I mean, I, I don't think most authors even care about their website. Yeah. Well, no, we care. John Scalzi is awesome, by the way. I met yeah, him, I him in person. Yes, and he is just absolutely hilarious and delightful and um, very, very kind. And um, I actually very much liked him. I very lot. much like his uh, Twitter account. I like his yeah. attitude. Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, he's a great guy. And he was at a writing conference um, that I went to. And yeah, he was a kick. Really enjoyed him very much. Are you going to have like counselors and things like that at the at the retreat? Or is it just going to be you and Christina? Just me and Christina, um, it, which will be fine because there's a lot of retreating going on. So <laughs> there will be some sm small groups and individual assignments. And we're planning actually a very fun creative um, treasure hunt activities where people will have assignments to go go forth out into the beautiful outdoors there, you know, either on the along the shore or in some of the other paths and look for things that inspire and then create creative projects around them. And the interesting thing to me is that, you know, my first thought is, well, I don't want to go to something like that because I'm not going to be able to write. It's going to be very disruptive to my writing process. But at the same time, it's an engagement. It's that you're engaging with other people just like yourself who are trying to write and try to create. I mean, it's not really about that big novel that you're trying to produce. It's about making that big novel better when you get home to it. Right. Well, really, it's about there will be time built in 
for for creative for creative work that that's part of a retreat if you're a writer then you need that time and one of the reasons i want to do retreats actually is because i've been to so many writing conferences and every time i'm <laughs> every time i'm at a writing conference and i'm in that hotel room especially when i splurge and have the hotel room to myself without a roommate i look around and go why don't I do this? Why don't why do I not ever just book a week and just go do this? So I have the space and time to myself to write and not worry about everybody else. Why don't I do this thing? And that was what inspired me to actually go to a couple of retreats. And one of the reasons I want to do a retreat, because I think that's important to have that space and time. And that's something that will be built into the retreat as allowing people time for that. Yeah, definitely. I think I don't know if I could work on like a big project, but I would want the time to write these little things that pop into my mind. It's a really interesting idea. And that's one of the reasons I reached out to Christina is I saw that cruise that she was doing. Right. This is a thought that pops into my head. Like you could do that. You could kind of be on a boat and yeah. workshop with people. I mean, why not? Yeah, you should go. You <laughs> should love come. That stuff. <laughs> oh, I'm going to compete. I'm going to start my own in my basement. <laughs> be me. And I'm going to put one in the newspaper and I'm just going to, totally be the new york version of you know your cushy cushy hipster life washington <laughs> lifestyle i'll be like the guy over here barely caring you know half open <laughs> box of entomans no <laughs> you, could, you could do that that, that would be yeah i know i do i love that and it just really does make the it makes talking to writers is just a fantastic way to spend an afternoon it is it is um, it's inspiring mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and it just no you're not alone like before you wrote that first novel, you were alone. Then afterward, you realize there's a bunch of people out there that kind of ran that marathon too. Right. Um, I do tend to ask a couple questions to finish up. But you've been very, very generous with the um, the advice already during the podcast. So I don't think I need to ask you for new advice. And you've already given the contact information. I'll include that in the right. notes. And my last question is basically, what are you reading right now? Like what content are you devouring that you would recommend other people take a look at? You know, games, movies, TV series, but mainly, you know, books and stuff like that yeah most mostly books i um i don't watch a lot of tv when i when i do i tend to love things like criminal minds and um <laughs> those sorts of kind of twisted mystery shows turn me on honestly um what i'm reading right now i'm taking a break because i needed to focus on my writing and i kept getting distracted by novels things i've read recently that i absolutely love i read the weight of ink um by rachel somebody or other can't remember her last name this is a fantastic book it's big and fat and it's mystery kind of, but it's literary fiction and it's really the story of discovering literature from the past, but it switches back and forth between modern day characters and a, a Jewish woman at the time of the plague who was incredibly bright and found a way to be able to write and study and learn um, in a world where that was really not okay for her. Um, that was a fantastic book. And then I read something completely different that was called The Butterfly, Co no, The Butterfly Garden, uh, the first book in the Collector series, which is a really twisted, dark thriller <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. Those are my two most favorite things I've read in the last couple of weeks. Or well, thank, thank you so much for being, uh, w well, no, thank you uh, for being willing to take Christina's recommendation and reaching out to me. So we yeah. have the opportunity to talk. I'm sorry that it took so long to get you on here. Um, and um, I'll get this thing out as soon as I can, but unfortunately it's going to be like five or six weeks. Is That's there okay. something in particular that you need to have it out for now or is that a good time frame for you no no actually that's great that's like very shortly after the book comes out we didn't talk about the book very much but that's okay <laughs> awesome <laughs> rabbit holes actually, right we talked about all the processes <laughs> that went around it you could tell where yeah. my mindset it is right i mean it's really it's the the writing part is so personal to uh -huh. to the writer yeah. themselves mm -hmm. and the the final product i mean you could talk about it until you're blue in the face but um are you doing it justice? It's going to be that person who reads it and loves it right. more so than the person who gave birth to it. That's going to do it the most justice in terms of right. selling it. Yeah, absolutely. My, I mean, you're the, the thing on 
the shelf now. I mean, you're showing yourself as somebody that I want to look into a little bit more and see, you know, what kind of stuff she might write. Right. I, that's interesting. Right. If I want to watch yeah. a Stephen King interview, I want to hear some stuff about being a writer, not about <laughs> his newest plot or something. I don't right. know. Right. <laughs> well, sure, absolutely. Yeah, Stephen King is a fascinating dude, man. He's... Yeah, he's a, I mean, we saw a genius during our time. They laughed at him earlier, but right. I don't think anybody did what he did. Anybody came out on top like he did anyway. Right. Right. And he did it his own way on his own terms instead of, you know, what they were telling him that he needed to be doing. And yeah, right. One awesome. more year. He's not one of three. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. No, I'm not going to dilute my, my brand or whatever. I mean, that's just proof that the publishing industry doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, right. especially with your third book. I mean, especially J.K. Rowling or whatever reality TV star got published instead of her. Oh, you know, right. Just, you don't know anything. Nobody knows anything right. until it happens. Right. Like that drip, drip, drip. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you never know when it's going to happen. That's part of the fun. <laughs> right. You never know. And that that's also this. Thank you. This was fun.